Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, second meetup of the year. Uh, Luke Feldman is here today mm -hmm. from Pongo Labs. Yeah. Um, he's a very experienced designer from Melbourne. Thank you. UX person, <laughs> startup pioneer. Uh, Sharab is also here. He's co founder, founder at Pongo Labs. And um, yeah, so Luke is going to tell us about uh, six years, I think, of lessons learned from uh, Pongo. Yes. the name of the product. Yep. All right. So, over to you, Luke. Thanks, guys. Very good. Please come and grab a seat. You don't have to stand up the back. I don't buy it. No? Stand? It's okay. <laughs> Thanks for coming, guys. I know everyone's time is at time poor, and I really appreciate you coming tonight. And I guess tonight, what did I want to chat about is the human computer interface and visual instructional design. And to Florian's point, I am one of the founders of a business called Ponga Labs. We've been around since about 2011. And um, this is, I guess, lessons learned, things that we did well, things that we don't do so well, and things that we've improved upon. And Please feel free to ask me any questions. When we started Pongo Labs, we found that there was a potential opportunity, and the opportunity was this. This is a typical enterprise worker. You look at their software, their body language is very poor, they're sort of hunched over, they're using their mouse, and you see a spinning wheel because the software is painful to use. It's not very good. Compare this to this young man who's <laughs> super, super happy, but he's using sh social media. He's just got an Instagram photo from his girlfriend. Now, we thought there's a big disconnect here. This just doesn't make sense. And we believe, and we've built our business on, the enterprise experience should be as engaging as a social experience. And it makes sense, right? Why can't you, you have fun with your social media, whether or not you're doing sending photos book? But then when you go to work, it's painful. So why can't it be the same? Or why can't you bring that, you know, that enjoyment, that social experience to work? And we built a platform around it. Now, really briefly about Pongo Labs. Um, we have been around, like I said, since 2011 and we've sort of grown. My business partner and I, I come from a user experience back background and user interface design. And I've had experience in the games industry and my business partner is an engineer very very good at what he does and he also understands creative so we have a nice overlap but we also have our expertise and then we have a team of around six people now typically when I present to people and they go oh what does Pongo Labs do I'm going to give you two slides that I actually use in my presentation when I'm pitching to a potential client the first one is this we grab these sort of processes whether or not it's paperwork, Excel spreadsheets, this sort of complex, annoying enterprise software, and we make it simple and we make it visual. And for us, this has been critical in, we've positioned ourselves in the enterprise business, so you're looking at global users, low literacy, English as a second language. You know, it's critical that if you're designing experience, it's simple, it's fun, and it's engaging. And this is where Pongo fits in. If you've got your workforce on the left, we have that interface that sits on top of these things. So we integrate usually with things like SAP or Salesforce, and we can pull data in from databases, and all that sort of disparate IT landscape, our platform sits on top, a really super simple interface for the people that are doing the work. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have this simple interface, the people doing the work, you're not going to have this, the BI tools and the BI information. The data capture will be poor. A little bit about our methodology. And in doing this, I've been thinking about it and, you know, over the past seven or eight years, it's been something that we've been running. You're a small business, you run, you iterate, you run, you run, you run. And we haven't really sat down and thought, okay, well, what? do we actually do and what do we have in our heads? So I've tried to get it out and I'm going to try to impart it on you guys. We've broken it up into three main areas. The first thing for us in Paramount is it has to solve a problem. If you don't solve a problem, no one will buy it. At the end of the day, that's brass tacks, that's how it works. And you know, when we started our business, we had the Valley of the Death, which was about a year, where we had this beautiful product and we had no one to buy it. 
and it was about getting out there, educating them, making sure they understand, you know, giving, getting that trust in there. So you have to solve a problem. Then there's the user interface, you know, and can I just see a hand? Who's UX, UI people are in here today? Okay, mostly. How about people are just interested in UX, UI, but don't actually work in the industry? Okay. Okay, cool. So I can get a little bit technical. Uh, that's good. So I'll talk about a bit more about the user interface down the track, and I can show you some of the stuff and the thoughts between what we do. And then there's the instructional design, which is very, very important to us. You saw the screenshot before where it had a picture of a, an exclusion zone around a truck. We try to put graphics into everything that, that we do. That is our point of differentiation in the market, a one-off one. Solve a problem. Now, when we started the business, it was pretty straightforward. This is what we did. We had the workforce, and then we had this. Now, back in 2011, 2012, it's pretty innovative. Get rid of your paperwork, put it onto a mobile device. Great. Streamline these processes and everything like that. But if you've ever done a search recently, if we continued on this path and only did this, we'd be out of business. We've had to iterate, we've had to improve, we've had to see the bigger picture. Where do we sit now? Well, we've improved things a little bit. We've still definitely got the users. We look at tasks and workflows now. So where there was something like a safety audit and you did it and that was done, we now have the workflow. What happens after the safety audit? Well, something needs to be escalated to the HSE team, then something needs to be put in process in place, and then there's a group to say, hey, was it done right? And then there's this, IT and integration. Now, this is something for us that we've learned over the, maybe the past four years. It's almost essential for us, because without this, you can easily turn off our platform. And when you've got a SaaS solution and a business, it's very easy for them to go, yeah, oh, yeah, we'll just turn that off, see you later. Once you've integrated, you're in bed with the big guys. You look at someone like one of our clients is a Telstra, and we've integrated with all their systems, you've got that stickiness. You've got the people using the software, and then it's integrated as well, so it provides more value to the business. You can get BI out of it. Solve a problem. So these are the sort of things that I guess we look at. Now, obviously, there's the what, the who, and the how. What is the problem? You know, really, if I'm looking at something and a business has asked me to come in and have a look at their process, what is the problem? To give you an example, um, we do a lot of supply chain where you've got trucks, they back up, food items come off the back of the truck with forklifts, goes into the fridges, and there's paperwork all over that process. You know, we went in there and said, okay, well, what is actually the problem? The, one of the problems was paperwork. Paper would get lost. It'd be handed over to the forklift driver, then go up to someone to get lost, then get torn up, damaged. Then there was another problem, which was, once I've finished the paperwork, I stick it on a big pile, and we're doing deliveries that happen maybe 100 a day. That's 100 pieces of paper that someone has to manually enter into a database. That's a nightmare. So you have to understand the problem. And for us, we said, OK, well, we can get rid of that and streamline that. Then you have to look at the environment. And that's one thing that we've found. For this particular supply chain client, very, very interesting because they deal with fridges, back of truck, open sort of supply chain areas, the office, where do they go, what do they take? And in the original problem, they had a notepad, you know, one of those clipboards, and they had all their paperwork on there. Now, we found that, again, when you're looking at change and behaviour change, you have to consider all these factors. And one thing was... If we said to them, okay, you're no longer doing this, you've done for 15 years, put that down, and now you're going to do something over here, people wouldn't do it. They'd be like, I want to go back to the clipboard. So what we did was, clipboard, take out, replace with tablet. And it worked. And everyone was like, oh, I can still do what I need to do. But then they had the added benefit of being able to go, instead of the handwriting, they just go tap, 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 tick, cross, tap, tap, submit, done. So much easier for them. And we had really great adoption. The next big thing and probably most paramount is the who. The who, human factors. Now, if you look at a scenario like a supply chain, we went out and actually went on the floor. We went and looked at their forklifts. We climbed in the back of their trucks to see what they actually did. And there were certain things like, for instance, they wore gloves. 
that if they went into the refrigerator, they had massive gloves on. So we had to consider that because, you know, if you've got a touchscreen device, it's not going to work with a glove. Work with a pen, but not with a glove. So there were things that we had to consider. And then there was also the future experience. Once you've done this and you want to roll it out and deploy it, how do you ensure that people are actually going to do it? And then there's the how. And for us, you know, this is sort of, I guess, as Pongo Labs, we do a bit of consultancy with a client. We'll look at their paper processes or their Excel spreadsheets or those sort of things, and we map it out. And a really good example is we went and spoke with one company, and they said, okay, this is our process, we're going to map it all out. And they mapped it all out, and they had technology, 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 technology. And I was like, okay, well, where do the people fit in here? And we inserted people, people, and a person, there was a person right in the middle. Now, this person was a part-time worker, and their sole job was to enter username and details and create new users into their system to give access to people through the security doors. Now, they completely omitted it, but if that person was sick and there was a new staff that came on board, they couldn't get in, and they only had that knowledge. So, you know, looking at the task flow and looking at the people as well, it's super, super important. And then we map the process out, look at the people, and then we chunk it down and we simplify it. Uh, a, a very simple example is, say, if you had a checklist that had 100 questions in it, we would chunk that down to, say, 10 little tasks that had 10 questions. It's, you know, then the user's more inclined to do it. It's not too onerous. It's simple. It's easy. Okay. I love this quote, and I really believe in it. And I constantly sit down with Shrov and we look back at what we've done six months ago and go, oh, what are we doing? And it's true, right? Because it's a really, really good measure. If you look back at your stuff three months ago, six months ago, and it hasn't improved, you're doing something wrong, you're not getting better. So you should be able to do that. And that was something when I read that quote, I was like, wow, that's so true. Because we look at our PowerPoint presentations even three months ago and go, that's not right. That just looks very bad. We need to improve it. Now, what I want to do is, I guess I want to talk a little bit about our interface. Now, since we deployed in 2012, we've gone through a few iterations, and I'm going to share with you some of the failings, some of the improvements, and where we've sort of learned along the way. This was our first version. Now, it's very crowded. But there was a reason for that, and the reason was at the time, they had some checklists that had hundreds and hundreds of questions in it. And what we wanted to do was make sure you get maximum content on there, so we did a three column layout. Now this sort of worked, but then you've got super limitations on text, labels, instructions, those sort of things. We had this primary navigation up here, sort of give, gave you a, a really nice user-friendly code that you could understand what tasks you were doing. And then you had this secondary tab navigation. Now this was, I guess, our innovative moment because rather than scrolling, 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 we could chunk things up and you could just tap across. Now, back then it was quite innovative. People do it a lot now, but still we learned from that. The other thing too that we did very early on was colour. So you'll see here this, in this particular item it's to do with safety and compliance. So we've used three colours, the green, the yellow, orange, well actually four, and red which we got rid of the orange and the yellow because from a um, colourblind perspective, it wasn't clear enough. So we learnt and picked all these things up along the way. But we also had these icons which were very, very simple. And if, even if you look at the, that's an NA, you've got tick, exclamation, across. Now in terms of these guys, this process, there was either a problem, which was across, or there was something that was improved or I asked someone to do something. So you weren't wearing a safety helmet, but I asked you to do it. So it's a, that's a yellow. Now, for the business, they already had that in the business, and we sort of improved that. Now, they had paperwork, and one other big problem that they had was they had checklists that were pre, in flight, and post, which means basically before the job, during the job, and after the job. Now, they had this nightmare, which is they go, we're going out to do a pre, and they drive two hours, and they get out there with that paper checklist and find out that the construction team had already started. So the checklist was useless. And that was a big pain point for these guys. So in the interface before this, there was a select if it's pre-in-flight or post. <coughs> now, the other thing that we thought was really, really cool is 
This was called interact, because I'm interacting with the page, I'm interacting with questions. We also had these other two things, and one was insights, and one was discover. Now, from a, a geeky perspective, insights was nine short insights on the data that's going into the system. But this was where the magic was, which is interactive with the data. So you go October, unplanned, vehicle, all audits, and you could actually, in real time, chunk down the data. Now this was really cool, and sure and I sat back going, oh, this is going to make us millions of dollars, and no one used it. <laughs> so it was this beautiful UI concept, but there wasn't the right need for it. At the end of the day, we found that integrating with their BI tools, which they already had and spent millions of dollars on, made more sense. So we got rid of it. 2012. The other thing too to note is the product name was Clickboard with a Q. I thought it was Kitsch at the time, Clickboard, Clipboard, sort of. <laughs> this next version, we did some improvements to it. And there was completion feedback, which was really great. So once you'd finished a checklist, it went green, it went tick. So the user could say, okay, I'll finish that section, I can move on. We didn't have that prior. Some other things too, add comment, add a photo. And we also did something really big, which was move to list items. So we got rid of the three column, because at the end of the day, it was just way too confusing. And you know, we tested those assumptions, and what we thought was they want more, it wasn't really, they actually wanted it to be clearer and easier to read. So we learned from that. Next iteration. 2013, we've added some more text up here, we've refined this, we've also added in this here, which is actually a description on what section you're in. And we proved the instructional design style. So we started heavily doing, well, doing a lot of infographics for clients, and there are just some examples there. But we came across a problem, which is what is selected, selectable? And these were competing. You're not sure what to click on. We had quite a few of our users going, oh, I want to click on this. It didn't work, so we had to think about it and redesign that experience. And as you can see here, we removed Discover and Insight because no one was using it. Mm -hmm. 2014, we did our first mobile first responsive layout. Now before that, all of our clients typically had tablet devices, strangely enough. So mobile was a second sort of level. It sort of, it worked okay. It would crunch down. But really, in 2014, um, growing the business and pulling on some new clients, we found that, you know, obviously, you've got your BYO device and, you know, those sort of things where everyone's got a smartphone. And it's saturated the market now. I'd probably say most of you have one or two smartphones, those sort of things, multiple devices. We refined the instructional design template, which I'm going to go into this further, but you'll see here, there's a really standout, there's one thing that's blue that's important. And we've also changed the hierarchy of what's interacting. So throughout the whole system, something that was clickable is blue. And we basically said, okay, if it's blue, and it's got a blue icon, you can click on it. Otherwise, it's not clickable. And that was the global rule. Happy times. We had pulled on some clients. We are starting to grow. We, got, we had some great users. And... Being in a startup or being in a small business, you have to iterate. And we saw, based on usage, that there was opportunity. And the opportunity was to grow a platform and take it in a new direction. So Shrov and I and the team sat down and we thought, okay, where can we take this? What can we do? Because before that, Clickboard was a platform that basically would grab your paperwork, some of your processes, mobilize it. We put some visuals in there. It worked great. People were happy with it. But there's more. So we came up with Pongo version 2. And this is what the platform looks like today. So we added some features. Now, one of them was task requests and workflow, which means we're no longer doing a single task. We're now doing stuff that can string together all these tasks. And Shrov and the technical team had done some really great smarts in the back end to really streamline our processes and what we do and get away from hard coding. So it made our platform more nimble. You've got requests, tasks, these are things that I can do. Activity, these are things that I've done. And people, because there's a big opportunity with community. Now, we also changed the global colour theme, which has made it sort of more of a, a blue-grey. Again, because the blue header and the blue bars and everything were competing 
with the other interactive elements and we want to drop those parts of the UI back and focus the colour on here. The other thing that we've done is you'll notice this is an enterprise piece of software. The colours aren't enterprise, they're quite quirky. We chose pink because pink is a colour, if we, we did testing on this, red is a colour that everyone knows as notification and they ignore it. Pink is like, whoa, what the, what's that? That's strange. And it's working really well on the platform because it's something that people aren't used to seeing. So it's sort of getting a little bit people to engage in the platform in a different way. Here's some example of if I click on tasks or things that I can do, we've got this. Now, the thing to note here is you've got an icon, you've got the name of the task, but then you've got a description. <coughs> Now, some may say it's overkill because you've got icon and the, thing, and the name, but having the description has actually worked out to be really, really effective because you can educate the user with a little piece more context before they get into the task. Um, here's once I've selected a task, you can sort of see it's very, very simple. You've got your header up here, you've got a tick, you've got a trash can. Can't do anything else. And you can scroll. You've got your elements. And they would have included this sort of global header that tells you and gives you context to what you're doing. Now the other thing, because I have a background in games and I worked many years in games company, did PlayStation games, Xbox games, there's an opportunity for gamification. Now, if you hear about gamification and the, the word's been sort of burnt a little bit, because people don't do it in the right way. They think if it's a high school table and you've got 15 and I've got 16, that's going to make us work harder. The reality isn't. It's not. It's actually going to make me say, okay, well, I'm less than you, I don't really want to work, that's annoying, I'm being scored. What we found out, and again, this is from our experience, now there's many different ways to do this, but we have this thing called an activity ring. And the more you do in our platform, the higher the ring goes. Now, it's not persistent, it's not a high score, it's actually real time. So if I do a lot of work this week, score goes up. If I don't do any work, the score goes down and I float down the list. And what we've been able to do is surface the doers. Now, you guys will probably, and for those people that are not from Australia, but you hear about the gunners. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. Unfortunately, most of them sit in management. Sorry for anyone that's in management. Or senior management. But there is a lot of people that are about the gunners. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. We believe, and when we first came up with this idea, we were actually presenting it to our group of friends. We work at a co-working space at the cluster, and we like to talk to people, and we like to get people involved. And I actually met with one girl, and I spoke to her about this, and we reward the doers. That's weird. And she actually got quite emotional about it, because she was like, wow, for the first time, and clearly she'd had some issues where she did all the hard work, Manager got the reward and she got nothing. And she was, it was really humbling because she was like, wow, this is a really cool idea because you're actually rewarding the people that are doing the work. Now, with one of our clients, um, our platform's throughout Asia and there's a team in Vietnam, which the head office is in Australia, and the team in Vietnam had never been surfaced to the business until they started using Pongo and they realised that they had some really, really great safety advocates that were super positive and going out there and solving problems, sharing information, you know, really creating a collaborative, a collaborative um, team and they floated up and they were actually seen and what the business did was they actually rewarded them, they promoted them, they made them SMEs, which is great. You know, how many times do you hear about a platform actually rewarding someone that then helps them get a raise? Like, you know, it's really, really cool. And then we have something else which I really love. Now, how this works is, it's a learning, what we class as a learning moment. And how it works simply is, if I use Pongo and I solve a problem, so say for instance, cables are here, and I take a photo before, and then I document a bit, and I take a photo after, I've taped it down, that create, get, creates a, what we call a learning moment. Now, the next person that comes into this room or comes into a room and says, oh, I'm, I'm just about to do a doc document there's a problem with cables, a little card slides up and it says, hey, Luke had the same problem as you. Luke works in the Melbourne office. This is how you could potentially solve it. So what we've done is we've grabbed 
the stuff that people are putting into the system and we're rewarding it and sharing it back to the users as learning moments, which has been really, really cool. Now, if you look at, say, things like induction, and for those that have ever worked with an enterprise client and you go first day of work and they go, okay, you're going to do your induction, they sit you in a room like this, they put up a PowerPoint presentation, it goes for about two hours, slide after slide, they might put some nice music there, and then at the end of it, you sign your name to say that, hey, I've done the induction, off you go to work. I believe, and we believe, there's a much better way to do that. So grabbing and looking at that sort of content, we can put it into our platform and it gets served out to people based on how long they've been in the system, how long they've been in the company as these learning moments. Now the other key thing to note here is this little guy's photo. One thing we found uh, through our research and also through clients that use things like SAP and some of the other big IT systems, Generally, if I get a notification, it'll say 247654 email has sent you a notification, log in to click that. There's no people, there's no person attached to it. And typically that'll just float down a list and you'll ignore it. We found that when you bring people's faces into it, that's someone who's the global HSE manager. I know he's, he, he's just down the corridor. He sent me a message. They're more inclined to comply, understand, and take it on board. So that was a little piece of information that a little golden nugget that we found was really, really helpful. So in summary, for the interface, here are some of the things that I've learnt and our team's learnt. And again, this is not definitive. It's an ongoing process. And if you ask me to do this presentation in six months, it will look very different. <laughs> but looking back over the years, this is the sort of stuff that keeps coming up for me and keeps coming up with us. Consistent. When you're looking at your interface, you know, back to basics, if you've got a back button, keep the back button in the top left-hand corner. That's where the back button lives. If you're going to have a label in the middle, keep it in the middle in the header. You know, those sort of things. If a pencil icon is going to be used for adding a comment, don't change it to a different icon. Keep it consistent. Look at the hierarchy. So, you know, in our platform, you've got a very consistent primary nav, which has only ever got navigation. Tick, cross, back, forward. That's all you can do in the navigation. Then secondary is information. What am I doing? What are my tasks? Give me insight. You have interactivity. And this was a, one we learned very early on. You'll see the different colours that we have in the interface when you're looking at a task. But when you're actually physically doing a task, I'm going through a checklist, there's only one colour that you know that's interacting. It's blue in our platform. That's it. We found that worked perfectly because as soon as you get the user past the point that, oh, blue is clickable, that's it. That's all they need to use. The whole interface. doesn't matter if they're reviewing audits, doing whatever they are, blue is clickable. So, you know, make sure people know that it's a button. The one thing, and I'm an Apple fanboy, I love Apple and I love their products, but over the past four or five years, they've really dropped their UI standards. And anyone that's looked at it, I can see a few people nodding. It's, it's terrible. You'll have text labels that are buttons. You'll have sliders that don't look right. And then you have placements of things that change between screens. They're really dropping the ball. And it's sad because I used to look up to them and go, wow, that is just amazing. And now sometimes I go, well, actually, what they're doing is not right. It's sort of starting to fall apart a little bit. So interactivity. What can I click on? And color. You know, color, and I should put iconography in there as well because... That's one thing too, for us having a platform that is used globally, we've learned a lot. Now, a really good example I like to share is the little X sign. Now, have you seen the X sign where it's got the person walking out the door like that? Now, this was something that it was like, okay, well, this is pretty cool. That everyone knows is exit. But if you're of African descent, that actually means the soul's leaving to go to the other place. Now, I read an article on this which actually said that they'd put out these whole line of movie theatres and they were wondering why no one was going through the exit. Because they had that sign up there. You know? It's just, it's something you would never think of, right? And it comes back to colour. You know, what people think is pink in some places, pink and green and those sort of things. And then it comes back to, you know, those icons where you've the little person icon, male or female, those sort of things. Playing around with those and understanding it from different cultures. Next one is space. Less is more. Less is more. Less is more. I 
we have a client and they use SAP and just recently we went and said, hey, can you show us how you do this process? And apart from this, and he was like, oh, spinning wheel. The interface was just completely chock-a-block of buttons, sliders, three triple navigations down, three columns in. It was just crazy. But over the years, unfortunately, you know, SOP started with a simple piece of software, but they've added. Client wants this, we're we'll added. Client wants this, we're we'll it. It's a new feature, we can sell it on the website. Shrov and I spend a lot of time, and it's painful, and it's been very painful for us to go, that's really cool, but we're not putting it in there because it adds another level of complexity. And there's, you know, it, it's just one thing that we've had a lot of really cool ideas, or maybe they weren't so cool, but we thought they were cool. And we just didn't put them in because for the product and where it's going and our user base, if you get it too complex, they just won't use it. Now, another thing just to add on that as well, in our interface, there's only ever three levels that you can go into. And I've done that by design throughout the whole interface. Task, I can look at a list and I do the task. That's it. That's as deep as I can go. And we've spent a lot of time making sure that you don't have this forever. You know, that forever scrolling list that they have on Facebook that you never get to the bottom or Pinterest, <laughs> it's not a good thing. Users need to be able to feel that. I don't know if you guys, I've done it sometimes where you scroll on Pinterest and it gets to the point where it's like a mind overload because I can't get to the bottom. And you know what? If you scroll really fast, they've actually got a footer that you can never get to. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's like, what? why do that? White space. Uh, you cannot underestimate it. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of stuff uh, in a sec about the iconography, but um, white space and having white space in UI around your text thing, it does matter. And I've put this in size matters, but it does. For our clients, we started the business in construction and utilities and uh, uh, quite a few sort of field force. And we found that generally, people had bigger hands, bigger fingers, and your standard apple sized buttons, which are like, I don't know, 22 pixels, it didn't work. So, clunky over it. Now, if I just go back to here, our buttons basically, and which I'll, I'll go into it in a little bit, but we've made them slightly novelty sized. They're big. They're really big. And it's made it so much better on the interface. So much better. Because we never have a complaint of going, oh, I can't find the button, or it's too small, I can't click it, you know, those sort of things. And then there's improve. You know, for us, again, small business, you have to iterate, you have to improve, you have to think about things. It's an ongoing process. If Shrov and I and the team just sat down and said, oh, we're not going to do any updates or anything, we probably, I would think, well, if we kept their clients, we'd be okay. But if you don't iterate, you, you go out of business, basically. If you don't learn, you don't improve, take on feedback, um, you need to be able to do it. You need to be able to test and validate. And there's this one here. I say iterate, but I say don't over iterate. Now, one thing that I have seen is where people iterate and it's too much and the user can't handle it because things keep changing. If you're constantly changing the interface and making improvements because you get oh, this is cool feedback, and it, it doesn't work from a user's perspective. And for us, we've found typically we have about a quarterly cycle in our platform to throw out a change or an upgrade and we give them a couple of weeks and let them know that it's going to happen. But any more than that, and I think it's almost like over overburn. They just, it's too much for users. These are some of the, some of the little infographics that we've got. Um, so now I'm going to talk about instructional design. One thing for us, and one thing for me personally, is I love comic books. I've done a lot of children's illustrations. I love drawing. Uh, I, I do life painting. I love that sort of stuff. And for me to be able to combine that passion in looking and grabbing text and complex messages and making it visual, it's a lot of fun. It's a real challenge, but yeah, as you can see from here, there's no text here, but you guys know what I'm talking about. And this has been an iteration over quite a few years, but we've now got a style guide down that when we create these new instructional designs, it can tell a story. And it's quite cool. And We've had a couple of clients, and Shrov and I have thrown around the idea of, you know, you could almost put together a task that's like a comic book strip, which is really cool. I like comic books. But here, the important things here is one colour that's important. 
I can tell the user everything's sort of faded out grey. I can see it. That thing is blue. That's important to me. And the storytelling. If those are linked up together, you're now looking at about a safety harness and making sure that it's tied off and hooked up at the point. So that's one way that we do the instructional designs. The other one is a zoom view. So you might have forklift there and you zoom in and show, hey, seatbelt, make sure you get the seatbelt on. And this one here is motion. So vehicle, we've tried to work with this and we've tried quite a few variations. This one seems to work quite well. Going backwards is the reverse beeper working. Sort of works. And then we do a comparison where you've got the good tick and the bad cross. And this tends to work really well. And again, I don't really have to tell you and put the text under there. Um, but you get the idea. Iconography. Now, we've sort of grown the platform, and I'm quite proud to say that throughout the whole platform, that's all the icons we have for the primary navigation. That's it for the whole platform, which is cool. That's it. Once a user learns those, that's all they need to do. If I'm in a task and I'm doing things, that's all they have. That's all they have to do. And then the only thing where variation comes into is when I'm outside and I'm looking at the different tasks that I can do. And that's where we sort of bring in the colour and, you know, forklifts or people doing work or whatever that might be. But when you're actually doing the action and the primary, getting around the app, actually doing my job, that's it. And that's been quite a few years to get to that point. Um, and you know, we started off with quite a lot of icons, quite a different thing, quite a lot of different designs and everything, but we've sort of nailed it to that. Again, it's pretty simple. You know, it's not rocket science. You can sort of tick cross plus, but it works. Now, a little bit techie, but not so techie. Um, a couple of things that we've done which we find really well. The main header in the app is the same height as every component of it. And these list components fit in this height. Now, on mobile and tablet, they scale out like this, so you can have your chicken cross and it scales out. But this here, and I'm very, very particular, um, and it's great that I have a business partner that is so particular about this, we work to the pixel. And I make sure it's a pixel because you can look at our platform and we get a lot of great feedback and I'm quite proud of it where people go, wow, that, that looks really great. And it's, it's sort of heralding back to the old days where you used to look at first Apple UIs and go, wow, that's really cool, but I don't know why. It just looks really cool. Everything sort of fits together nicely. And it's because you look at things like spacing, consistency. You know, that spacing in there is the same for these icons here, around these icons here, throughout the whole interface. Makes things simple, makes things nice and easy. So in summary for this, indicative, not explicit. Now this is a big thing when we've been doing infographics and instructional design. When we deployed our first version, we had a conversation with a client and they said, we want to put photos in there. We want to put photos of trucks, we want to put photos of forklifts, of cranes and everything. And I said, look, it's not going to work. And the reason is that it's not going to work is, this is a forklift and it's a Hyundai forklift. The person in Thailand has a different brand forklift and they're going to go, that's not my forklift. It's explicit. And it was something that we'd proven because we did some testing with that and found out that that works really well. So we went the visual path. If it looks like a forklift, I can then go, oh, I can connect that to my forklift. So indicative, not explicit. And reduce the shape form. Now, I have a little thing of testing it and I, you don't have to do it, but when we're doing our icons and everything, I'll actually sort of squint my eyes so it goes a bit blurry. Now, if I can still see and make out what that shape is, I'm heading in the right direction. <laughs> so, usually, like that forklift, it would be paired back to its bare silhouette shape, and then I add in the details where it needs to be. And that's the sort of little rule of thumb that I've been doing, and it works quite well. Consistent. Consistency. You know, the il illustration style and the vector thing, we've improved that and iterated that over time. But if you look at a Pongo product and you look at any of our deployments, all the visuals are all very similar. You know it's a Pongo product. You know that illustration, you know that blue sits in there and it works really, really well. You've got a primary point of interest. One failing that I've seen in um, a lot of designs and I had it in our first version with, it was competing. I had things here, things here. What am I, what am I meant to be looking at? So you have that primary point of interest. And then the iconography style. Now, 
there's so many platforms, so many websites out there where you can download your free icons and icon sets. And I don't know about you guys, especially the UI developers, you'll see the ones that sort of gel well with you, where they've got consistency, like it's a one pixel line and it does everything one pixel. But then you've got something with six pixels and one pixel and then all of a sudden the interface starts looking a bit sort of off. Doesn't feel right because you've got different weights. So getting a consistent iconography style. And then the message. Now this is a little personal challenge that I like to do. And I do this and I, when we do our new instructional designs, we float it to everyone with no text and say, what do you think this is? I give them a little bit of context, like it's, it's in this realm of construction. But my goal is to do that because, and Shroff and I were talking about it today, I want to be able to get tasks to the point where there doesn't need to be text. That's where I want to get. Now, whether or not I get there, I don't know, but that's where I want to do it. Because I can tell you now, all of our clients that have our platform look at the picture first and mostly don't read the text, which is really, really interesting. And to that point, when combined with visuals, the text is secondary. You know, the other thing with the text, and I won't go into the information architecture because that's a whole presentation on itself, but for us, we look at things like language, you, me, he, she, employee, manager, make sure that it's consistent across the board, and also make sure it's short and concise. The biggest problem with a lot of enterprise is technical talk that's written by someone that's technical, like a BA or something, and then it's three or four questions in one, and then they ship that out to someone that's out in the field and they expect them to understand they've got a tick and a cross and it goes, are you doing this, 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 this and not this? How can you do it? So we grab that, pull it apart, and if it has to be three or four different questions or three or four different points of interest, it is. So we want to pair it back. A little stat, quite proud of it. We've got over 460 instructional diagrams that we've created in our platform. Which is cool because every time we create an asset, it's ours and we can reuse it for clients. So every client that we pull on now, we can actually pull these out and reuse them again, which is great. And finally, where next? So for us, you know, this is, I guess, bringing you up to where we've, where, where we've been and where we're up to right now. Um, where next for us? Motion design, we've been spending a bit of time in that, and I'll just show you a little animation here, if it, if it plays. I've had some experience in um, animation, and I did work with Cartoon Network when I lived in the US, and this for us, uh, in educating and instructing a user, can be really, really helpful, because now you can start telling a story, and that animation, by the way, he pops up, plays it, tick, and then it stops. I've just got it on a repeat. But you can really start educating users on a whole new level. Now, if you've looked at some of those um, infographics that we've got, and then I overlay some interactor, interactivity in there, where you can look at it and see the screw go in, you know, there's a whole new level of education and opportunity to engage with people. And that's some of the things we're looking at. Now, from a techie perspective, there's a thing called a progressive web app. Now, I don't know, has anyone heard of it? No? no? Okay, one person. Okay, so this is very new technology. And in short, our platform is a web app. It runs through the web browser, Chrome, Safari, that's where our software is. And we've found that it works very good because you can do it on desktop, you can do it on my mobile phone, I can do it on a tablet, and it doesn't really matter what device you've got. Now, web apps are almost as good as native apps, and we've all got a pretty good experience there, but there's one big thing, which is this. If I've got my little Pongo platform and it's loading data from a database and I try to do something with the UI, it stops. And it stops until that database call is finished and then it loads the UI. Now, we've spent a lot of time making it so that from a user's perspective, you don't really notice it. But it is an issue. Now, progressive web apps, which is new technology which Apple has just started to embrace as well, but um, I know Microsoft and quite a few others, Google have embraced it as well, basically means that you can have multi things going on at once. I can have UI animations going, I can have database calls going in the back end, and they all work together. Which for us, and being sort of like geekly cool, that's very good. It improves the user experience massively because you don't have to create these stop points. You can now have a more cohesive experience. And then we're doing some interesting work with AR. And, you know, 
it's very much the gold fields and the gold rush at the moment because no one's really got a good application for AR. I could have a monster here and things come out of it. I can go around it, shoot it, those sort of things. Is there hasn't been a really good application for AR. And there's some serious usability considerations that we've been coming up against in doing it. And one of them is this. We're put, putting together an application, and I'll give you a bit of an insight, but think about this. I'm looking through this. I'm not focusing on you guys. I'm looking through the phone. Now, if you're looking at those sort of industries, say where I'm on a warehouse floor, I'm walking around a truck. It's not safe. It's not safe to do that. I'm doing this. You know, you see people walking around just reading their phones. It doesn't work. So I see that there's going to be potentially some major hurdles to overcome. You've got glasses and those sort of things. Interesting. Um, the other thing too is, from a UI perspective, no one's really created a UI. If you look at all the experiences so far, generally they're an object there and I can walk around, I can see it, I can measure something along here. There's no real interface that's overlaid on top of the AR, which is interesting. And we've been looking at some different ways. In terms of a business application, we have an idea that we're working um, with Deakin University because we do a lot of research projects with students. But we have a few clients in the logistics and supply chain area and what our application we're sort of exploring it is a truck pulls up, I pull out my phone and I go into AR mode or whatever you want to call it, the video, the screen's running, it does an OCR on the number plate, so it brings back data in real time on what that truck is. But then we've got points, little dots attached around the vehicle that I can go around and say, for instance, someone's noted that there's a damage to the tire. Or someone's noted at the back there's a seal that needs to be looked at. I can go around and sort of interact with the data in a different way. And then do things like estimated time for unloading and those sort of things. So engaging with the user in a different way. Now these are preliminary for us and we're sort of testing the waters. But it's going to be interesting because my little sum down there, AR and UX, no one's really solved it at the moment. So it's going to be interesting times. Thank you. That's it. I'm going to open the floor to questions. So please, if you've got some questions, now is the time to ask. Yes. Um, you say AR and UX. <coughs> we don't know. What about Google Glass and how they've been using it? So you, you do have an interface there. Um, yep. That is one area that we've been, and we have looked at, where I think there's actually some opportunity. I think, I don't think, it, is it Microsoft? Someone else changes on before. They've brought out a, they look better, you know, they're more formative. That can work, and I think there's potential there. With a phone, if you're trying to do your job, if you're, say, someone working in a factory, you need your hands. So the glasses, yes, I think there is an interesting application there. But I don't think the rules on what user interface and how that and the user experience haven't really been written yet. Which is exciting times because if you do have an interest in those sort of things, you can really pave the way. And you know, it's like say an Apple Watch. I don't think anyone's nailed a really, really good app on the Apple Watch that everyone goes, I need that. And it it's same with um, the iPhone. I was living in the US when the first iPhone came out. And the App Store had like four apps in it. And it was that time where everyone's like, what do we do with this? I think that's what AR is at the moment. So it's going to be interesting times in the next sort of 12 months, but I hopefully um, we'll see more than just monsters coming out of boxes. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? So your instruction language reminds me of the IKEA catalogue. IKEA catalogue or Lego? You know, they're two examples that yeah. are global phenomenons. Because if you look at the Lego instruction manual, there's nothing in there. There's just pictures. Mm -hmm. And look, I really like what IKEA have done with their instru instruction manual. And I've done a lot of research looking into those sort of things. And it's something that it works really, really well for people. You know, you can deploy it wherever it needs to be. They don't have to print different languages. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a really great idea. Although AR might do a better job of showing me... Look, it could. Yep. Yep. And I guess, you know, looking at 
what data do I have access to and how can I present that to the user in a meaningful way? I'm looking at a computer, well, what can I do with a computer? You know, that sort of stuff. So there's going to be some interesting um, work, I think, in combining and looking at data, the huge amount of data resources that we have bringing to the user so it's relevant. Come on, guys, I was hoping for a few more questions. <laughs> yes? What were your greatest challenges developing this platform? Like, what was the, 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 you know, the couple of obstacles that you really had to overcome sitting in the Okay, so I'll give you one, and I'll only say two letters and everyone will get it, IE. <laughs> IE is the most broken piece of software. Version 24756.A and 2476.BC Things will work and things will won't work. Okay, inconsistencies in browsers, because we have a browser-based platform. That has been something. Um, then if you look at the Apple platform, you know, we've had everyone... If, if you've ever developed an app for Apple, you'll understand the pain. And before Pongo, I had an app business. We built iPhone apps and Android apps. Now, you build this beautiful app and it get great comments and everything, and then they upgrade their API. And all of a sudden, the app had stopped working. And they didn't tell anyone, didn't tell the developers, they just made an API redundant, which was your whole platform was hinging on that. We had that a few times, and one of those through the web browser was taking a photo. So through a web browser, if you're on an um, iPhone uh, running through Web Safari, Mobile Safari, or Google, you can click add a photo, opens up the camera, and you can take a photo. Now, we had one deployment where Apple had updated their system where they just turned it off. So we're like, ah, uh, we've got people using this and now they can't take photos. So those have been problems which have sort of been out of our hands. Um, in terms of software, technology and building, you know, probably the biggest thing was at the very beginning, which if you've ever heard from a startup community, the valley of the death, which is you've got a product and you need to get your first client. And that was a very stressful time because uh, it was only a struggle for myself when we started and we're eating into our savings, and it was about a year, and our partners were like, when are you gonna make some money? When are you gonna make some money? When are you gonna make some money? I don't know if this is a great idea, you probably shouldn't have done this. <laughs> but we got through that, and you know, that was, I guess, persistence, and also, you know, getting out there, meeting with people, and we had a couple of people that sort of believed in us, and believed that, yeah, and could see that we're passionate about what we do, and gave us the opportunity, and that sort of has leapfrogged up from there. Yes? How do you fight the temptation to add a new feature to your product when a client with big money is throwing it, throwing it at you? Okay, this is going to be really frustrating for some people, but we have got to the point where, I guess, for us, we're confident in what we know, and we, we know and we do it well. We've been doing it for seven years. We can always improve and we always iterate. But typically, the client will ask for something that if you question them about the relevance... Now, sometimes they have a great idea, right? And you go, okay, well, we can do this and we can do that. that. But a lot of the times, it's just like, someone from management said this and that and said, oh, we need this feature, we need this functionality now, and the business is going to fall apart. When you actually dig into it a little bit and do some due diligence, you find that that's not the truth. And the biggest thing that we've learned, and we actually... In the initial couple of years, we actually turned away a couple of projects because, and it was a very, very hard decision, because they didn't fit in with what we were doing. And they would have made us a lot of money. Shrub and I would have been very happy. But it didn't fit in, and we were like, this is where our platform is, and this is what we do, and this is what we don't do. And it didn't fit into that. So we said no. And that has been probably one of the biggest decisions that we've made to say no and when to say no to those sort of things. Yes? Yeah, maybe related to that, so <coughs> how, much, how much do you customise between the different clients? Or are you trying to select clients from a different space where you don't have to customise a lot? When we started the platform, if we had to go from version 1 for client A to client B, we had to do a lot of code cutting. It's quite manual and our framework was sort of there, but there was a lot of code. Um, now we've got the platform to the point where we can deploy a new deployment without actually having to do any code, which is great to have the platform. And Shrovel and team have done a lot of work in getting rid of the dependencies on code cutting. So now we can create new tasks, new workflows 
through a, an interface that sort of looks like a spreadsheet um, and upload that into the system and away you go. So we've been able to sort of improve that massively. But again, I, I think probably nine times out of ten, if a client wants to do A, B, C, D, if you sit down with them and work out where their pain points are, we can figure out how to sort of fit it into our platform and how that works. Yes. The colour blue for the interactivity, yes. is there a reason behind choosing a particular colour? There is. Very good question. So when we first started, the first deployment was to do with compliance. So we had red, which is bad, orange, which is means something's gone wrong, and green, which is good. We needed a colour that didn't compete with those, that was going to be action. I'm doing something outside the, the checklist or the spreadsheet or the process. And the blue was the colour that, I guess, I like blue, personally. <laughs> but it fit in with our colour spectrum and our colour palette. So we've created over the years some style guides about different colours and how they all sort of fit in. You'll notice that the colours are quite vibrant, and it's by design. I've deliberately done that and made sure they're quite vibrant. But the blues and everything, you know, off buttons and on buttons, there's, I guess there's been a lot of refinement to how that looks. But the blue was something that complemented colour thing. And typically blue is corporate-y and when we first started it was like we had the blue header navigation with a bright blue button. It sort of worked at the time. Yes? Um, most sort of successful startup founders that I've come across are from like a technical or dev background um, but you yourself seem like you're from a design and creative background. Yep. Um, do you have like <laughs> now, look, that's a really good question, and to be honest, I've got an answer. It. Um, I will say, look, you probably can tell I love what I do and I'm very passionate about it, and find a partner that shares the same level of passion. And you know, for me, Shroff is exceptionally good at what he does, and he does dev, and I do UX. I can program a little bit, and I understand it, and he understands design a little bit. So we have a bit of an overlap, and then we have our team to support us. But it's that mix which, throughout my life until now, I had never met someone as a business partner that could meet me pound for pound on you know, making sure the design works right, making sure the button works, making sure we've got these things going. And he can. And that's been, that has been a critical thing for people, finding that partner. Now, in terms of saying, hey, where do you find partners? I don't know. We were met through a mutual family friend. So it was very strange. And we both had a successful um, tech business building software. I was doing apps. And we said we wanted to create something that was ours, that we owned the IP, and then we could license it. So we still keep it. I was sick of doing really cool apps and handing off all the really cool IP that I'd created to the client that would then inevitably kill it. <laughs> so I wanted something to keep and to nourish. But yeah. Any other questions? Feel free to come up and have a chat with me afterwards if you don't want to ask a question now.